So I'll start introducing our next speaker. He's Professor Noshia Contractor. Um, he is the Jane S. and William J. White Professor of Behavioural Sciences at the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science, the School of Communication and Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. He's the Director of the Science of Networks in Communities Research Group at Northwestern University. So his social network research brings together engineering, technical and social dimensions, seeking to understand the socio-technical drivers and dynamics of how we use networks to create teams, collaborate and share knowledge and in doing so shed more light on more general questions of social processes. So it's research that um, recognises the vital importance of collaboration and build our capacity to do that collaborative work. So very much fits in with things we've been hearing earlier. So welcome. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thanks again for giving me this opportunity to join uh, via video. I am, um, I'm actually uh, coming to you not from Northwestern University. I'm here at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation headquarters in Seattle, Washington, and I'm very grateful to them for making the arrangement so that I was able to join you through uh, through video today. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear, even if it was just for the last couple of minutes, uh, my good friend George Richardson uh, evangelize about systems dynamics, and I don't know a better exponent doing that, so it was really fun to get a chance to, um, to hear a little bit of that. So hi to George as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk with you today for the next 27 minutes or so is a book project that I've been working on that is titled Some Assembly Required, and it's about the assembly of teams. Um, a lot of the work, I know that some of the issues obviously that you're talking about there has to do with scientific teams, and I'm going to be uh, sharing with you some of the insights that we've been developing in understanding why, while there's a lot of work that is done on making teams more effective, there is much less work done on how teams are assembled in the first place and how the assembly of those teams is going to influence the uh, outcomes, the processes and the outcomes of the teams. So that's going to be the main focus of what I'm going to be uh, talking about today. I'm going to start by uh, talking about a person by the name of David Ferrucci and this, uh, the, the, his, uh, his name is probably not one that you're familiar with, but what he did is something that many of you might have heard of. It was called the Watson, and it was a computer that was created by IBM that you could ask it any question in natural language, and it would automatically provide you with the right answer, at least in most cases with the right answer. Um, it, was, it became very popular in this country. I'm not sure how well known it's down under. But in this country, it became extremely popular because the IBM took this computer and actually put it on a very uh, well-known national quiz television show. And it competed against several of the smartest uh, people in the nation. And on many occasions, it beat the humans. So the name of this was IBM's Watson. And the reason I wanted to start with this is while the technology of Watson is obviously extremely challenging, uh, what uh, David Ferrucci wrote in this article in the New York Times was that building the team that built Watson was far more challenging than all of the technology. But I want you to start thinking about how you get into teams. What are the ways in which you are, um, when, when you are asked to join a team, how do you decide whether to accept it or not? When you are asked, uh, when you want to put a team together, how do you find the people you want? Part of what David talks about in this, which is quite interesting, is that in many cases, the ways when you come up with a crazy idea, like trying to build Watson and you want to talk to people about it, it takes an enormous amount of effort to try to figure out how you're going to convince people and recruit them to join your team. Why should they leave all the projects they're doing and instead spend time on your team, for example? And so this became uh, an issue that got me interested in thinking about what do we know about how teams are formed? Well. Before we get to that, there's a couple of classic slides that was published in Science Magazine by my colleague Brian Utzi and his collaborators Ben Joan and Stefan Bukti. Um, some of you may have already seen this, and so forgive me if these slides have already shown up in earlier presentations uh, at your event. But the first one of these slides is what Brian and his colleagues did was they looked at about 20 million research articles over five decades from the Web of Science. And they also looked at two million patents. And they found four very interesting facts. The first was that as we look over time, more and more of our publications are being done in teams rather than done in solo. Second, not only is more and more being done in teams, but the amount that is being done in teams is, in fact, 
uh, getting higher impact than those things that are not done in teams. You need to get cited more. Now, academics may say, well, of course, if there are five people who write an article and they all cite themselves, of course, it's going to be cited more. This research corrects for those effects and still finds the impact to be higher. The third finding is not only is more work being done in teams, but the work that is being done in teams um, across disciplines is, has an even higher impact than work that is being done in teams in a single discipline. And then finally, the fourth finding is that things that are done in teams from different disciplines and from different geographic locations, namely virtual team science, has an even higher impact than interdisciplinary teams that are geographically co-located. Now, at this point, you could almost say we might want to just stop the discussion right here, even though I see I have 14 minutes and 50 seconds left, because all we have to do is get up and go find people from other disciplines or other geographic locations, and we should be able to publish high-impact research. Unfortunately, uh, there's other research that has been done by Jonathan Cummings and Sarah Kiesler, which find what appears to be a contradictory result. They studied NSF-funded project teams and looked at the collaborations amongst these teams based upon the number of disciplines and the number of universities involved. The graph that you're seeing there shows on the y-axis is the productivity of the group. The x-axis lists the number of universities involved. And you see that there are two lines, but both lines are sloping downwards and as the number of universities increase, which means that as the number of universities on the team increase, the productivity of the project falls. Further, there are two lines because the blue line that falls faster represents fields, uh, projects that had five disciplines and the red line represents a project that only had a single discipline. And what this shows us is that the more disciplines are involved in a project across universities, the less likely the project is to be productive. This might, again, as I said, seem like a paradox. They did show there were some caveats. If these people had prior experience and worked together, then the effect of distance and the effect of different disciplines was somewhat attenuated. So is this, in fact, a, uh, a paradox? Well, I'm going to argue it's not a paradox, because what it's actually showing is that most of the time doing interdisciplinary work across geographic locations is terribly difficult. However, when it does succeed, it succeeds spectacularly. And the Web of Science results that Brian and his colleagues found were only the success stories, things that were actually published, as opposed to the kind of work that never gets published because it never makes it out into the real world. So. Um, what we want to do is to see what can we do to help build teams that are more like the spectacular successes that we saw uh, in the published results, as opposed to a lot of the dismal failures that happen most of the time. And that really is a large part of what has shaped my interest in looking at this. I think that there are four key takeaways that I want to make sure I leave you with. And that the reason I think that this is a really good time for us to be talking about how to assemble teams, and scientific teams in particular, is because there are four factors that come together quite well. The first is we have a substantial amount of social science theories that help us understand why we, want to why we are motivated to come together to work in teams. Um, second, we, for the first time, have a lot of data that allows us to test those theories and to use the data, in turn, to be able to actually make recommendations on teams. The third point is that in addition to having theories and data, we also have some very interesting methods, some of it's fairly sophisticated network analytic tools uh, that I think are particularly appropriate to help study the assembly of teams. I must put a plug here for my colleagues at the University of Melbourne, Gary Robbins, Biff Patterson, and others who have been amongst the leaders in developing these uh, exponential random graph modeling techniques uh, that I think are very influential in helping us provide inferential tests of how these different um, um, methods and how these different methods can be used to help assemble teams and help us uh, test hypotheses about it. Finally, the fourth point, uh, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about today, is that even if we had theory, data, and methods, if we didn't have the traditional infrastructure, it would be almost impossible for us to crunch the numbers that are necessary. Some of the methodological challenges today are not entirely purely methodological challenges, but actually computational challenges uh, in terms of the algorithmic complexity involved in running some of these analyses. Um, so start quickly with the theories. Let's say that I mentioned that there were several theories that have been very influential in helping us understand how teams come together. Uh, there are a few in particular that I want to touch on. 
Uh, if you think about the way you form teams, one of the reasons why you might say you form a team is that person that you want to work with is an expert on the topic. That's based on theories of self-interest. It says, I'm an economist. I want to maximize my individual utility function. You're an expert on systems dynamics. I want to work with you. Um, however, it could be the case that if I approach George and said, I want to work with you on this, um, he doesn't necessarily get anything out of it, and so he may not return my calls. So I might turn things around and say, well, George, I know that I need your help in terms of uh, getting some assistance on systems dynamics. And in turn, I might be able to offer you to, uh, some help in terms of network analytic methods. And if that is of interest to him, then we have set up a social exchange approach that allows us to, uh, to work better in a team. A third rationale for a team is not that I want anything from George or that George wants anything from me, but we have concluded the two of us have a better shot of getting something from a third party. A fourth, fourth approach could be that I only want to form a team with someone because I see everyone else is interested in forming a team. There's a popular person that everyone wants to form a team with. That's the contagion metaphor. A balanced metaphor says I want to form a team with A because A is friends with B and I've already been on a team with B. So you like to be friends. You like to be on a team with friends of your friends. Uh, others could be things like homophily. I want to work on a team with people who are similar to me or proximity, the people who have similar or same geographic location as me. The nice thing about these approaches is that each of these different motivations that I described to you have their unique structural signatures, by which I mean that if we look at networks that are generated by self-interest, there will be certain unique structural patterns in this network that will allow me to uh, help understand that self-interest is what drove the networks. Now, in many cases, in a complex real network, we might simply reach, reach the conclusion that if you had look at a plate of spaghetti network, the network is driven 20% by self-interest, 15% by exchange, 10% by balance, and so on. Now, the reason we are able to say those kinds of claims is exactly because of the statistical techniques that I was mentioning earlier. These are the P-star uh, or exponential random graph model approaches that essentially provide a statistical macroscope to detect structural motifs and allow us to understand, by looking at that, what might be the motivations by why people come together. Of course, having theory and having methods is great, but until recently, we had a big challenge of trying to empirically test these theories about team assembly, and that was because the data was just not available. A colleague of mine, David Lazar, has a couple of slides here that I'm going to share with you. He says if you're an astronomer, you get your data from the Hubble telescope, and it costs you $2.5 billion. If you're a particle physicist, you get your data from the CERN particle accelerator when it works, and that costs you a billion dollars a year. But if you're a social network analyst like myself, this is where you get your data from, and it's priceless. Well, not quite priceless as we've seen with the recent controversies surrounding uh, the government uh, access to some of these data, but that said, it's still an opportunity for us to be able to look at this in ways that we were not able to do previously. And on the basis of these arguments, David Lazar, who I just mentioned, and a bunch of us, we published an article in Science a few years ago that said we now are ready to talk about a computational social science approach that allows us to be able to look at a new approach to social sciences. You know, we have traditional surveys, you know, ethnographies, certainly interviews, we have experiments, but we now have a new approach at our, at our disposal, and that is to look at scale at massive amounts of data that are available. I'm going to spend the last uh, seven minutes of this presentation to quickly go through four of these approaches, how we've used computational social science to understand four approaches to the assembly of teams. Um, I'm going to make the case that as you assemble teams, we can think of it from a compositional level and say that members of a team are, the team is essentially a collection of individuals. And if I have the right people on the team with the right skill sets, the right personalities, then I'm gold. A second argument is to say, well, those things are important, but I also want to see what kinds of prior relationships these people have. Have they worked previously? Do they trust one another? And so on. And so that's the relational level. The third argument is the multimodal level, which says I'm, I, ha I can think of a team as the circles of the people, and T, or the, or the square there, is the task. And I want to see if I can match the individuals with the task. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of how some people may be more or less inclined to get attracted to doing some software development, depending on whether the software, or in this case the task T, is an open source software or closed source software. 
And then finally, I want to talk about the ecosystem level, which I think is quite an interesting approach to team assembly. It says that the likelihood of a team to be assembled is going to depend upon all of the other teams that we belong to and all of the other members who belong to those teams and then the other members who belong to the teams that those members belong to. So if you can start out with the recognition that we belong in general to multiple teams, these teams are overlapping. And so we can start with our thinking of a team as a circle, but we have to recognize all of the other teams that we belong to and all of the other team members on those teams and which teams they belong to, because these people bring in ideas into our team, and that helps us uh, in terms of making our own decisions, etc. This is work that is quite unique. Because in the past, most work that is done on teams likes to think of teams as clean cut, that everyone is in just one team or the other. And what we are saying is that, in fact, looking at these overlapping teams is a feature, not a bug, that we need to do. So starting with a compositional level, I'm going to give an example of a study that has nothing to do with team science. It has to do with online games. And it's a large project where we get server-side data from the, uh, a game called EverQuest 2, which is a massively multiplayer online game. The purpose of the game is essentially for it's called EverQuest. The, the purpose of the game is to bring teams together to go kill monsters, and that's what you see in the picture up there. We hypothesized that there were two aspects of the team that were going to be very influential in helping the team succeed. The first is the diversity of the team. In these games, uh, individuals take on characters, a fighter, a mage, a scout, or a priest. And then the goal is to see whether groups that are more diverse are more likely to be successful. The second quality was a group member's cosmopolitan level. That is, to what extent is the member in your team also a member on other teams, and to what extent does that impact the success of this team? Uh, we measured success of the team by looking at four categories, the number of experience points that you gain in the game, the number of monsters that you kill or the non-player characters, the amount of level that you gain, and the number of times you get killed, which is a negative measure of performance. In these games, you get killed, and then you can come back up for a short period of time. But what did we find? We found that diversity, in fact, helps the group to achieve more. Um, notice, I didn't mention this earlier, but because this is at a computational social science scale, we were looking at several thousands of teams that were involved in millions of combat records, et cetera. So that's the kind of scale we don't normally get when we looked at when you do survey studies, for example. So here we see that having diversity in the team improves experience points. You kill more monsters, you gain higher level. But it doesn't seem to help with depth. On the other hand, having a team where members belong to a lot of other teams, it doesn't help with the gains, but it helps you to avoid the loss. So it helps prevent death by bringing in perhaps some kinds of new experiences that you can apply to making sure you don't die within the game. Again, moving on to the next one is the relational level. The relational level says that um, in addition to looking at the attributes of the individuals, it might also help to see how they were, what kinds of prior relationships that they had. In this case, we did look at some team science. We looked at over a thousand grant proposals funded that were submitted to the NSF, not all of them funded, in two interdisciplinary programs over three years involving over 2,000 uh, principal investigators and co-principal investigators. Uh, we wanted to find out who submits proposals, and we found that individuals are more likely to submit proposals with their co-authors, and that individuals are more likely to submit proposals with those they cite. We thought this was quite sensible. If you have co-authored with someone, you're likely to submit a proposal with them. If you cite them, you're more likely to know what they do, and that's going to help you become more likely to submit a proposal. We changed the question a bit and said, who submits successful proposals? And here what we found is that individuals are more likely to submit successful proposals with their co-authors, but they were less likely to submit successful proposals with those that they cite. And this might seem counterintuitive at first, but what it really means is that if I'm submitting proposals with people who I don't cite, it means that we belong to different intellectual communities and we are citing different literatures, which in some ways actually increases the likelihood of the proposal being innovative because you're bringing literatures from different areas. So this is an example of how looking at the relationships amongst individuals and their prior relationships can provide uh, an additional impetus into understanding why teams assemble and why some teams are more successful than others. The third category I'm going to focus on is the multimodal level. Here I'm going to look at software development teams that are uh, participating 
in it, which is a social media platform for people to do nanoscience. It's called NanoHub. And your people come together to work on software development that is then um, made available on the site. And we had, again, server-side data on who came together to form the teams and how successful the software was that they developed. The success of the software was determined by whether it was used by more than 250 users. You see the two columns on the screen. On the right, you see unsuccessful teams that had less than 250 users. And, this, and the one column on the left shows successful teams that had more than 250 users. I want to point here specifically to the fourth line in the yellow color, which is the open source. And we find that open source was less attractive to people who, were, even though it was successful, that people were less likely to join teams that were open source. I was somewhat puzzled by the result. But what we found out at the end of the day was that, in fact, what was happening here is that because of our academic uh, incentive systems, smart people in academia are not incentivized to work on open source teams. And that results in the fact that you have that negative motivation to join those teams. The last uh, level of influence uh, that I'm looking at here is to look at ecosystems of teams. Here again, we wanted to look at the same NanoHub team assembly. And what we found there was that if we look at the x-axis here, the teams that had connections with a lot of other team members uh, would be on the right-hand side when teams that, in terms of the x-axis, teams that had connection with few others, like 0 to 10, would be on the left-hand side. Obviously, a lot more teams had connections to few other teams as compared to uh, having connections to a lot of other teams. The coloring on this shows that the blue bars are those that made unsuccessful software, and the green were the successful software. So what we are seeing out here is that at the lower edge, the near that is between 0 to 20, you find that there's a predominant of blue as opposed to green, which means that most of the teams that had connection to few other teams were not making successful software. When you go to the right, when you go beyond uh, 25, you see that the majority of colors there are green rather than blue, which shows, again, that they are more successful. I see that I'm now 45 seconds over time. So I'm going to, I, I have a little more stuff to talk about, but I think that I've covered the main issues that I wanted to touch on here. Um, I, if, I, if I, during the Q&A, if there is time, I can show you what we have done here, essentially, is taken these data and built tools that allow us now to build recommender systems based upon what we've learned about what makes teams successful. And that I think that becomes an important part of trying to be able to take the lessons of team assembly and help us do better matchmaking in scientific teams, just like we've been doing in other areas, such as um, in romance matchmaking and so on and so forth. So I'm going to just stop with that and leave the key takeaways that I mentioned earlier. We, this is a good time to be studying this because we have theory, data, methods, and computational infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you also for, for keeping to time for us. Um, now, are there any online questions at first? Um, oh, we just have one comment from Karina Lang from Brisbane who's saying, thank you very much. Uh, this session and the conference is helping me to see how my science communication practices fit into the integration and implementation matrix. So, thank you. Great. Thank um, you. And Deb, a, com a question from you. Hi, it's Deborah O'Connell from CSIRO. I've worked probably across uh, 10 or 12 different organisations in the last 25 years. and. In not a single one of them was there ever the opportunity to assemble a team in any way, whether it was a private consultancy or a university yeah. or a government yeah. department or now in CSIRO. Right. Right. You're generally, particularly in resource-strapped environments, very constrained yeah. to who's available. Yeah. And then you're constantly trying to match how you're going to design your work to play to the strengths yeah. of your team. Mm. And so, mm. although I really loved what you were saying, it's a world that I just don't recognize ever having yeah. played in yeah. or ever having had the opportunity to, ever will have the opportunity to play in. So mm. I guess mm. I'd be really interested in what you can take from what you've learned about assembling teams sure. to how to deal with a team that just just randomly thrown together a lot of the time and then you have to work out right. how to get the best out of it. Okay, so it's very appropriate that you ask me that question when I have the acknowledgement slide on, and you see on the acknowledgement slide that the second row of my acknowledgement slide is from three defense related uh, units the Army, the Air Force Research Lab, the Army Research Institute, and the Army Research Lab. 
And I get this comment from them all the time, which says, you know, assembly is nice and there are certain places, certainly in, in a lot of science, people are, uh, you know, have a certain amount of freelance capability and they call them prospectors and you can choose which projects you want to work on when, and it's a luxury that may not be available in many other situations. Certainly in the Army, they are much more interested in staffing. So on the basis of that, we've actually developed a two by two uh, uh, sort of uh, two by two uh, quadrant, where we say on the one hand, you have complete volition, which is what I've spoken mostly about today in terms of self-assembly. On the other hand, you're completely staffed, that somebody else makes decisions of who is going to be on your team and what you have to live with. That's one dimension. The second dimension is the extent to which these decisions are made on a completely ad hoc basis, as opposed, and I think you alluded to this, and at the other end of the continuum, they're made on a data-driven basis. That is, they're actually informed by some data. And we make the argument that, and I make the argument here, that in fact, in most cases, even in situations where you are hoping, hoping that your boss knows what team they're putting together based upon data, most of the time it's fairly ad hoc. And that in both of these instances, and the same thing is true for self-assembly, when we put together teams, we often don't do a systematic comprehensive scan in order to be able to make assessments of the best people who could be on our team. It's often a quote unquote convenient sample. And so part of the message here today is not so much just focusing on the self-assembled volition based teams, but to move us in fact on the other axis. We're moving away from sort of ad hoc decisions on either self-assembly or staffing and moving us more to data-driven approaches by which we can make these decisions. And by data-driven, I mean two things. Obviously, it involves having data about these people, but also the insights that we get about what kinds of connections are likely to make it more successful. So um, I, I, I hear your point, and I think that the Army in particular is has been pushing me in the, on that same issue in many ways and saying, um, you know, how do we make those decisions where it's not entirely voluntary? and I have a, a PhD student of mine who's looking at how to take a, you know, a, a, a large platoon and based on certain tasks, how to optimize teams that, so that in two scenarios, one is you have one really good team, the best possible team out of 100 people, uh, or that if you want to put the 100 people into five 20-person uh, teams, then how do, you find, how do you put them together so that all five teams on average are going to be pretty good rather than just one team being particularly good? And resources comes in as a big issue there. So these, these are all really interesting issues. And in some ways, I'm remiss in focusing attention entirely on the self-assembly part of it today. Um, but I did that in part just because for an, uh, in, scientific, in the scientific space, that is, that is more prevalent in the software development in the scientific space than it might be, as you point out correctly, in many other circumstances. Thank you. Now we have a question at the back. Hi, Lyndall Joy Thompson from the Invasive Animal CRC. Wonderful talk. I've done a little bit of social network analysis in the areas of innovation and weed management, funnily enough, with CSIRO. And one of the things that we um, really came up with in CSIRO, that in terms of team, as, team assembly, the role of particular entrepreneurial individuals was really critical yes. to actually assembling teams. And it might relate a little bit to that idea of self-assembly and not taking a systematic approach. But it also had a real impact on the longevity of the teams and the way yes. that they, I guess, that historical recombination that Stark and Vedra talk about. And I wonder how your ideas, I guess, because I'm more familiar with the idea of um, innovation and social network analysis, how your ideas are relating to, um, say, Stark and the idea of intercohesion and structural folds? Right. So, um, so the work, I'm, I'm extremely familiar with uh, the work that David Stark and Balash Petras did. And in fact, uh, Balash is going to be uh, at Northwestern. We're doing a workshop on network science meets the science of teams in about four weeks. And Balash is one of our speakers to talk about the work he's done. In particular, his more recent work is looking at uh, video games and the design of these video games and the teams that are focusing on that and the, and the role played obviously by things like structural fold. Um, so let me situate what I described in that context. Um, our arg argument, and again this was not something I had a chance to talk about today, is that there are different types of teams depending on what the goals of the teams are. So there are some teams that are focused primarily on exploration, new ideas, innovation, looking for new ways of doing things, disruptive technologies. 
There are other times where the focus of the team is not so much on exploration, but on exploitation, that is being able to exploit existing resources and to execute on it. Um, a third category might be that the goal of the team is not to explore new ideas or to exploit existing resources, but for mobilizing purposes. Very often, even in science, there are groups that come together to set standards, to set ontologies, to set different practices, or set or work on common instruments that they could then use. So in that case, it's a collective action motivation that brings them together. A fourth one uh, is one that we simply call bonding which is basically saying that you have individuals who are engaging in certain kinds of activities. Conferences is a good example of this, by the way, uh, of how you build trust with one another, you, build, you press the flesh, you build the social ties, and that that becomes an important uh, function of some teams. And some team activities are focused exclusively on that. And then finally, you have teams that engage in what are called rapid response activities. Uh, in the sciences, that's most commonly found in cases of people who study things like earthquakes or volcanic eruptions or some kind of climate disaster where you don't really plan for it, but you have, you're waiting for these things to happen, and you very rapidly jump into a situation where you could deal with it. Why am I bringing up these? The motivations that I was talking about earlier, your know, self-interest, collective action, social exchange, etc., we have hypothesized that these motivations are differentially more beneficial for what so for these different, but depending on the goals of the team, whether it's exploration, exploitation, mobilizing, bonding, or swarming. And so we built up a taxonomy that says, depending on what are the primary goals of the team, the teams may have multiple goals, but depending on the primary goals of the team, some of these theoretical motivations become more important. And to answer, to go back to the question you asked about innovation and creativity, that would fall squarely within the innovation, uh, within the exploration context, the first category, where obviously um, you know, things like balance are not going to be so important. You don't want to be talking to friends of friends. That's not where new ideas come from. You don't want to be spending a lot of time talking with people who are similar to you, the homophily argument because that's not where new ideas come from. So there are some very systematic ways in which you could try to gear team assembly based upon what it is that the goals of the team are. And um, I think that in, in science, there is obviously a bias towards looking for innovation and creativity. Uh, but I'm talking right now with some colleagues, uh, working on a project with some colleagues at Harvard Business School who are interested in looking at teams of lawyers who are processing various uh, issues for a client. And there the focus is less on creativity uh, not that I have anything against lawyers being creative, uh, but the focus is clearly more on executing some pretty straightforward tasks and doing it in an effective and efficient manner. Thank you very, thank you very much. Now, we are at lunchtime, but I noticed that Gerald, did you want to make just a quick comment? Um, yep. Yeah, Gerald Minchley from the University of Hull in the UK. Can you put up your last graph again, please? Did you mean the, oh, the, the bar chart? The, the bar chart, the one... Um, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't see it, but uh, never mind. Um, Are we able the, to... Okay, keep going. Right. Uh, there, there are two very different interpretations you can make of that that would have very different mm -hmm. implications for team building. So one is that... Mm -hmm. The most successful people have lots of different connections in other teams. But the other interpretation, which I, I personally think is more likely, is that people seek out the, su the successful individuals to create teams with. Um, so I just wondered what you think of those two interpretations. Okay, so, so, so your argument is essentially uh, the, the causality argument in which direction it goes. Is it the case that successful teams are the teams that have people who belong to, uh, are successful because they have members who belong to a lot of other teams, or are you saying, uh, or the reverse, which I think is what you're suggesting, which is that people who are successful are going to be in a lot of other teams, and that's not the cause of their success, but in fact, it's the outcome of their success. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I can't hear you. So, yeah, okay. yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, yes so, that is what I'm saying. I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and you're right. When you do a cross-sectional study of this kind, there is no way to be able to tease out which direction those go in. Um, one of the ways in which we've done that in another project, which I didn't get a chance to talk about, which was on, on looking at people who are submitting proposals, is we took people who had submitted a proposal, uh, and I think that this will get at what you're talking about. So let's say there were three or four people on the proposal. Uh, this is from proposals in the area of clinical and translational science. What we did was we took those four people, we took all the articles they had written, so it was all the other 
publications that they were on and then went one step further and said all of their co-authors we took all of their publications so we created an ecosystem based on publications around each focal proposal now notice that the focal proposal is being submitted today all the publications that we looked at preceded the submission of that proposal so there we would have at least some extent of having some temporal uh, causality to see whether this proposal today is likely to be more successful based upon the ecosystem. And we found part of what I reported in the software uh, study, but the other thing we found was that the proposal was more likely to happen if there was some amount of overlap in the ecosystem. If the ecosystem was too independent and they didn't have much overlap, then the proposal was less likely to be submitted. However, the proposal was more likely to be funded if in addition to having a certain amount of intellectual coherence in the larger ecosystem, in the immediate neighborhood, they didn't have that much of connection, which is to say basically that there was member A on the team and she had public, uh, publications with different people and B had publications with a lot of other people. There was not a lot of overlap between the publications teams of A, member A, member B, and member C. So it was that sweet spot between having coherence in the larger ecosystem, but a lower amount of uh, overlap in the immediate neighborhood of the ecosystem. OK, thank, thank you. you very much. That might have some way of looking at this. I mean, I think the issue you raised, of course, you know, is one that might, is, this is not going to be the, uh, the final solution, but it, it gets a little better than the, one of the nano hub where you clearly couldn't see the, coral, the causality there. All right, so it's all really rich and interesting stuff. Thank you so much. And can I ask everyone here um, to join us in thanking both our speakers today, so George Richardson and Noshi Kontraker. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really sorry I haven't had a chance to join you in person, but I wish you well for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Now, so it's lunch Bye -bye. now. Um, we have 45 minutes for lunch, and then there's um, Professor Michael O'Rourke talking about structured dialogue to uncover.